I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal to begin reinstating U.S. nuclear sanctions on the Iranian regime. We will be instituting the highest level of economic sanction. Any nation that helps Iran in its quest for nuclear weapons could also be strongly sanctioned by the United States. Well, welcome to the world today. I'm the Majid Khan, and there you've heard it from the horse's mouth, as we say proverbially. Uh, Donald Trump, President of the U.S., has finally uh, formally walked out of the JPCOA, the Iran deal, uh, better known as the Iran deal. Uh, let's talk about that, and uh, to discuss this uh, very major development in international affairs, uh, we have with us on our guest panel today, first of all, Ambassador Selim Nawaz, and joining him, we have Ambassador Aslam Rizvi. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Sir, I'll start with you. Uh, first of all, let's go over the reactions that have come in from various quarters around the world, and I'd like to start with the uh, reaction that has come from Iran, and they say that uh, this decision was an act of psychological warfare against Iran. And there is a lot of uh, conjecture and uh, concern that the real issue behind uh, walking out of the Iran deal is, again, a regime change operation in Iran, which is desired. What's your opinion, sir? I think I'd uh, concur with your assessment. Uh, the whole thing is based uh, basically on a Trump election promise. However, uh, it's an international agreement, which means that there are more than just two signatories to it. We know it's five plus one in Iran. And uh, you don't renege on international uh, agreements so comfortably as to just say, I'm going to walk out of it like in the Paris Agreement. Uh, however, Mr. Trump has done it, and the Iranian response uh, has spoken of psychological warfare. They've also, uh, President Rouhani has also indicated the hope that this agreement would stand, that others would uh, stand by it and fulfill their part. He's also pointed out that the IAEA is satisfied that Iran is fully compliant, compliant with the treaty. And therefore, uh, the grounds for uh, what President Trump has done, uh, has really gone and done, don't exist. Right. Uh, Rizvi Saab, uh, it also seems, and there are a lot of uh, commentators that are commenting on the fact that everything that Mr. Obama had done previously in his eight-year term seems to be an anathema for Mr. Donald Trump. And every single uh, uh, word that has gone in in, in the diplomatic terms uh, has come to naught as far as Mr. Trump is concerned. He walked out of the Paris Climate Accord. He also walked out of the uh, trade agreement with his uh, European allies, and now this. Uh, where do you think this is all heading towards, sir? Well, uh, you know, he has done that. Uh, I think more for domestic um, uh, reasons that he has done so. Uh, uh, he's trying to undo everything. The healthcare, uh, uh, of course. also. Also, the agreement with the, the um, uh, part of the, uh, the Pacific Trade Agreement right. he backed out on that. But he's not the only one who's backtracked on agreements made. Uh, President Clinton, Clinton had made one with uh, North Korea. Uh, then comes Bush, and he scuttled that. And uh, again, another, uh, you know, during the Trump's, uh, during the Obama's uh, administration, we had signed a uh, deal with regards to Pakistan the Kariluga bill and so on uh, from there. Trump comes and he, you know, on one pretext, the other, he, he set it aside. So, uh, so this, but this is unprecedented, what he has done, uh, because um, this was not a, uh, just a bilateral deal. It was a, you know, multilateral deal, and it was sanctified by the United Nations Security Council resolution. So uh, uh, this is sending a very wrong signal. Nobody uh, ever is going to be trusting uh, the American uh, president's word, uh, uh, you know, they will think twice um, before um, abiding by it. And I think there is a uh, implication on this to what is going to happen now with North Korea as well. Because um, in my opinion, I think this will strengthen the North Korean leader's hands uh, to negotiate uh, with um, America. Uh, because, uh, you know, as a past experience, number one, 
And secondly, according to media reports, Trump was looking for a quick deal on the uh, nuclear disarmament on the part of uh, North Korea, much like what they had done uh, with Libya. Uh, but I think the um, North Koreans will be wary of that. I think they will want a graded kind of a, a deal of uh, you know denuclearization, which means different things to different countries. Right. Uh, sir, let's also talk about the fact that does this decision by Mr. Trump uh, make the region as well as the U.S. safer as his claim because he said that the, de the deal is fundamentally flawed without actually categorically saying what the, the exact flaws were. But that deal did make uh, uh, his European allies feel safer, uh, except for maybe uh, some regional countries were, that are antagonistic towards Iran are not so happy with that deal. Uh, going forward, sir, uh, Mr. Rouhani has also announced that I have instructed the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization to take necessary measures for further action so that, if necessary, we can resume industrial enrichment of uranium without limit. So does that actually end up making uh, U.S. and its allies and Israel in the region uh, less safe or more safe, sir? I think essentially this is a psychological gambit. It's a counter-psychological gambit. Because Iran would, in my opinion, want the agreement to stay in place and uh, the other five, other than the U.S., to continue to honor it. And also, if uh, Iran's economic situation is somewhat under pressure, so added U.S. sanctions will make Iran uncomfortable. However, Iran wants at least world opinion on its side. At the moment, it has world opinion on its side. And uh, this is, in my view, you know, psychological fencing. Basically, he would want to continue to honor the agreement as Iran has done in the past. And the quid pro quo would be that as far as possible, the agreement should stay as far as possible uh, in its original form. Well, so it also sort of reeks of bullying tactics being employed by the U.S. against another sovereign nation. Uh, let's also talk about what uh, the European uh, Union Diplomatic Chief uh, Federica Morgrini said. She said that stray true to your commitments as we will stay true to ours and together with the rest of the international community we will preserve this nuclear deal. But on the other hand, the United States, uh, Mr. John Bolton has come out and threatened or warned European uh, companies that are working in Iran to end their operations within six months or, first, or face further sanctions from the U.S. How is that going to play out, sir? Well, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, as a statement has come out from the uh, European Union side, that the U.S. have made life hard for other countries also. And, you know, they have, uh, undoubtedly, all the countries who are signatories have expressed regret uh, and concern about the, uh, the deal. Uh, uh, the, the point is that, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, Trump in his speech had highlighted that they have definitive proof that the deal, they are cheating. In other words, the Iranians are cheating. But then, you had the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State, most recently in their con Congress. And, and, and the hearing. heads of all the intelligence uh, uh, agencies also, also. Uh, giving, uh, or, uh, and, uh, giving their statements as witnesses that Iran is abiding by the deal. And it is the U.S. that has yes. renegated on the deal. So. And the IAEA has been also on uh, record for doing that. So I think there is, um, uh, perhaps apart from the domestic um, angle of the uh, withdrawal from there, there was also, I think, a, as an agenda for uh, seeking a regime change, as you hinted at the earlier on. Um, don't forget that it was in 1953 uh, that uh, they that did America bring about started a, meddling yes, in Iran. And then they, you know, uh, supported Iraq against Iran to try and uh, bring about a change. They shot down a civilian aircraft uh, from, uh, through a missile from there. They have been involved in Afghanistan. They have been involved in other parts uh, from there. So I think, um, uh, uh, considering now Trump has uh, with him uh, the uh, uh, former Ambassador Bolton, now a national security advisor, I think there is one of the agenda is likely that it, it could be trying to seek a regime change. Now, um, uh, it's interesting to see that European Union, uh, uh, plus uh, even China and Russia and, and China in particular, while expressing regret, have said that they will safeguard uh, the economic part of the agreement also. So there is a desire for the, uh, everyone, minus America, to try and preserve this uh, deal which was considered to be a good deal. Right. Uh, so uh, I just want to go over what France, Germany, and the UK have said. Uh, they said that uh, we regret the US decision to leave the JCPOA. The nuclear non-proliferation regime is at stake. 
we will work collectively on a broader framework covering nuclear activity post the 2025 period, ballistic activity and stability in the Middle East, notably Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. And uh, he further said the French President Emmanuel Macron on Twitter said that uh, the Iran deal by its uh, formal name, the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, is now finished and he's deeply disappointed. So is Moscow. Moscow also uh, came up with a statement saying that deeply disappointed by the decision of the U.S. President Donald Trump to unilaterally refuse to carry out commitments under the JCPOA. That's the Russian response. So now it seems, sir, that uh, the world is aligning itself. We have uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S., and maybe India on one side, and we've got a different bloc developing, which is the Russians, China, uh, the Iranians. Uh, where, where does that leave Pakistan, sir? Pakistan is I in quite a Pakistan, fix right now. Uh, I don't really think so. I think Pakistan would stand by Iran's continued commitment, is my impression. Iran uh, is on the right, morally, ethically, as far as the treaty is concerned. Also, one has to realize that uh, Mr. Trump is unpredictable, uh, to say the least, although in this particular case, he has been predictable. But uh, I think there is a certain consciousness in the United States of uh, uh, seeing all problems as a nail because they wield the hammer. So the tendency is to use power where the use of power may not be appropriate and here power doesn't necessarily mean military power. Initially it will mean sanctions. However, uh, uh, five significant nations, uh, four of whom are members of uh, the P5. Security Council. Uh, have been uh, unusually uh, blunt in their uh, uh, concern, in their regret, and the expression of the hope on the part of the three European countries is that uh, they've also urged upon Iran to continue to stick to the terms of the agreement and uh, therefore have made it very clear that they would like uh, the status quo as far as possible to continue. We're also seeing a, a, a phenomenon, sir, that uh, Saddam Hussein was targeted for having weapons of mass destruction and this mantra that the U.S. comes up with from time to time to use as an excuse to enter into foreign countries and, uh, uh, and cause regime, uh, regime change or any other uh, mischief that, that they continually uh, do. Uh, how is that going to play out, sir? I mean, this is, this is going to be a very problematic situation emerging in the, in the Middle East uh, when the U.S. walks out of this deal. What, what, are we, what are we heading towards? Is there a plan, plan B, that the U.S. has as far as uh, renegotiating the deal is concerned? Well, uh, you know, they uh, want to have a, uh, a real comprehensive deal, quoting uh, President Trump. But then, uh, you know, the existing agreement already had a clause uh, whereby, and they had uh, during their preliminary discussions up to before the deal was signed, they had identified things like the ballistic missile and the um, Iranian influence in the region and so on. And uh, it was said that we would tackle the first issue of the nuclear uh, program first. And then as, as the time goes by, they'll be able to uh, come and work the other thing, including the, the, um, uh, the American hostages which are in, um, in uh, Tehran. So um, uh, now he's talking about a comprehensive deal. How can you for go forward on a comprehensive deal when the, uh, the main aspect, uh, you know, they have uh, backtracked on that. So I don't think there is a possibility on that. As far as the... Using nuclear the nuclear uh, excuse to enter Iran or cause a conflict well, in Iran. Well, you see, that, that this really places, uh, you know, um, Iran in a, in a difficult uh, situation. Um, on, on one hand, uh, that uh, if uh, it was to go ahead, um, with the industrial, um, uh, you know, development uh, or, uh, of um, fissile material, the the uh, problem would be that they will now come up. Uh, it, it will give the uh, the Israelis and the Americans and you know uh, with the Saudis and the UAE and they are standing by and clapping to maybe take some military action in the region. So uh, this deal, I mean, has uh, a, a grave uh, um, worry and concern because uh, on one hand. It could lead to a new conflict in the region. On the other hand, if uh, not, uh, Iran could start on a nuclear program and uh, become 
a nuclear state, which is again, uh, you know, a pr proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons uh, from there. And uh, thirdly, the important thing is that the, you know, uh, Israel has been talking about it, and so has the Americans are talking about, and the Saudis and the others talking about a nuclear race. But who started the race to start with? Israel. Nobody talks about the, the fact that the first country to do so. In fact, who's the, which is the first country in the world to produce nuclear weapon and to use it? And what about our own region? Uh, who has helped whom here to, uh, to make Pakistan go nuclear? So it is the bad policy of the Americans which are responsible for the you know, uh, grave situation that is so evolving in the country. Instability the across the world is yes. what we are witnessing, and it is caused by the policy decisions of the United States. Yes. Would you agree with that statement, sir? I would agree with my colleague and with uh, your uh, uh, query. Essentially, this is uh, an act on the part of the U.S. administration which makes very little sense unless the regime change uh, policy, uh, there is a danger of it being put into some kind of operation. I think the Israelis would be itching to go at Iran and to go at Iran before it becomes nuclear. So a preemptive so strike is what you're hinting at. A preemptive strike is possible. However, there will be hostility right across Europe and Russia and China. And I can think of very few countries other than uh, those newly sympathetic to uh, the Israeli-American cause in our neighborhood. I don't think anyone else, for whatever it's worth morally, will be in a position to uh, support adventurism of this kind, which could lead to a, a quite possible uh, that Iran would retaliate. Iran would retaliate with Saudi Arabia, possibly the, the first target that comes to mind. And the devastation then essentially is visiting the Muslim states of this region because uh, Israel being neuter, uh, it's an unequal uh, fight. However, if you look at global uh, trends, the Americans are uh, risking a lot. They are a declining power, although they may not be in absolute decline. But uh, a war in the Middle East is going to cost huge amounts to Israel-America. So the danger is there, you can't rule it out, but it would be uh, extremely poor statesmanship, in fact, quite the opposite. Right. So most of the European countries are urging Iran to show restraint. Uh, I would also like to add a few comments that uh, other uh, players in the region have made. For example, uh, Turkey has said that the unilateral uh, withdrawal of the United States from the nuclear deal is a decision that will cause instability and new conflicts. Uh, then we have uh, Syria's comments, which Damascus strongly condemns the U.S. president's decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal with Iran, which shows once again that the United States is not honoring its commitments and international agreements. So this is also a concern, sir, and uh, uh, what we are witnessing is kind of a, a polarization of the rest of the world against the U.S., Israel, and a uh, few countries in the, in, in the Middle East. Uh, how is that going to play out, sir? Well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, you must uh, realize that uh, the, uh, um, the geostatic uh, uh, strategic situation that uh, prevails, uh, Russia is not going to allow uh, America uh, to try and bring about a regime change because of the, you know, Moscow uh, has very strong uh, relationship. Uh, President uh, um, Netanyahu is right now, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is right now in uh, Moscow. There is a summit uh, taking place, and they are going to be discussing also. Uh, the, uh, as you rightly said, the other countries are very concerned about uh, the situation that is prevailing uh, from there. Look, um, look at the spy scandal, uh, spy issue that took place, uh, uh, Russian spy. The whole of Europe and everybody was behind, uh, and you know they started. The diplomats uh, were being sent. Uh, they imposed sanctions on Russia because uh, of that, sir. And sanctions, and they're deported, and so on. Today, there is a rift between uh, America and Atlantic uh, Alliance. 
there is now China and Russia and uh, the European Union on, on board. And so uh, a unilateral action by, uh, let's say, Israel, perhaps supported by the Americans, will not buy, uh, get any uh, buyers in Europe anymore, unlike in the past when there have been cases and so on. So I think the, the whole world scenario has changed. Um, and economically, of course, there are going to be problems for the Europeans, and they're not happy as it is with the trade sanctions that um, uh, America had introduced. Now, these new sanctions that they are talking about, which will affect not only the American companies, but also outside companies. You know, so I think the European companies will think twice about doing business. They'll have to choose with doing business either with America or with uh, the rest Iran of the world. or the other countries. But then again, you know, uh, the uh, Americans themselves are a, a victim of uh, what he said. One of the things the uh, uh, Trump had said in his, uh, you know, um, a campaign was to, uh, you know, improve the industry, bring more business and so on. This deal, uh, by scuttling this uh, agreement, he's also scuttled the 20, uh, um, uh, I think 20 Boeings that they're going to buy. Right. But, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, starting from 2017 to 2025. Of course. Now, uh, $20 billion worth of deal is gone. Sir, so just hold that thought. America we've, as well. we've been joined by Ambassador Zamir Akram. Uh, he's with us on the line. Let's get his views on these developments. Thank you very much, uh, Akram Saab, for joining us. Sir, you've also been with the IAEA. Uh, the IAEA has also maintained that Iran is holding on to its end of the deal and that's the U.S. which has walked away from it. Uh, what sort of a scenario do you see developing in uh, future uh, international relations, sir? Well, first of all, I think that this is a very short-sighted decision because uh, this will give the Iranians you know, a free hand to do what they wanted to do, and it will not achieve what the U.S. had uh, desired to achieve through this deal, which was to limit the Iranian nuclear program. So first of all, I think that this will not serve America's long-term interest. I think it's also dangerous because uh, the only other option now left for the Americans is to try and use force to reverse or stop the Iranian nuclear program, which will cause uh, further uh, disturbance and further instability in the region, which is already very unstable. So I think there are uh, there's a growing danger of another American involvement in Iran this time uh, after Iraq and Syria. So I think this whole issue has become highly dangerous now. Uh, and sir, in your opinion, what, sh what sort of a course should Pakistan be thinking about charting in these uh, very murky international waters at the moment? Well, as far as the Iran deal is, is concerned, we have, all, we have always stressed that uh, we support such an arrangement. And I think that uh, other major powers like Russia and China will continue to abide or will continue to honor their commitments under this agreement. So we should, first of all, express our opposition to this American decision and, and underscore the, the fact that this is going to further destabilize the region and globally as well, the whole process of arms control and disarmament. But Thank you very at the much, same time, Yes, sir, if you, may, you may continue, sir, if you wanted to add something. Yeah, okay. Now, what, all I wanted to, to address what you are saying about our own security, I think that... As of now, our security, our deterrence capability is quite strong, and we have no quarrel with the U.S., we have no quarrel uh, with any of the other, except our nuclear uh, deterrence is against India. And it is an effective deterrence, and we have credibly demonstrated that we can deter the Indians in this. So I do not see any direct threat to Pakistan, but of course, if the situation in our neighboring uh, country, Iran, is destabilized, then of course we will have to uh, ensure that our security is also protected and that the right. fallout does not come on Pakistan from that place. Well, thank you very much, sir, for sharing your views with PTV World. That was Ambassador Zamir Akram. Uh, sir, uh, you heard what the ambassador said. If there is a conflict in Iran, uh, it would have a terrible spillover effect for Pakistan, as we witnessed in 79 when the Shah of Iran's government was toppled. We had a huge influx of uh, Iranian refugees in Pakistan in the, in the late uh, 70s. Uh, and we already are, are playing host to over uh, 5 million Afghan refugees. What sort of a situation would, uh, would Pakistan be facing uh, from the fallout of any kind of a, a mishap that would uh, take place if whether Israel or any other country were to enter into a conflict with Iran? 
So, uh, I would think on balance that this is an adventure that the US and the Israelis, if potentially it happens, is something that they would be very powerfully advised not to undertake. It is going to disturb the globe. It's going to disturb regional stability. It's going to damage the Muslim world. And uh, as far as taking in of refugees is concerned, Pakistan has shown extraordinary magnanimity and uh, generosity in hosting uh, our friends from Afghanistan for a very long time. However, these are not easy situations as all of Europe is finding out. Uh, and uh, in fact, our tolerance level and our ability to accept the, uh, you know, the side effects have been of a much higher order than that displayed by most other countries. Uh, even Afghan refugees to Iran and Afghan refugees to Pakistan, since I've dealt with Iran for some five years in the foreign office, the Iranians were much more strict in controlling the movement. The movement. However, there have been benefits. There have been advantages. Some of the fallout of large refugee populations has not occurred. However, I think uh, with this much global opposition, probably good sense is likely to prevail because what happens is, A, the war is going to be extremely costly. B, the Middle East will become more unstable. And I don't think Israel is in a position unilaterally to benefit in the long term. In the short term, it might celebrate and congratulate itself on having done something, uh, you know, which uh, is dear to the Western and uh, to, to the Americans and the Israelis. But the destabilization Israel has been at war for over 50 years now, straight. And I don't think uh, Israeli public opinion itself would uh, countenance with uh, equanimity that Israel is going to a war where the rest of the world is agreeing that Iran is not at fault. So I think in my view, the Israelis will have to, and the Americans will have to think very, very hard before uh, they can uh, work out the cost benefit analysis of uh, adventurism. Sir, I would also like to go over the comments of uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He said that uh, I call on other JCPOA participants to abide fully by their respective commitments under the JCPOA and all other member states to support this agreement. Now, on a, on a brighter note, let's say that uh, Iran shows restraint and the rest of the European countries also want to honor their commitments in their deal, but uh, America, being the spoiler in the situation, would also influence its European allies into dishonoring their commitments. Uh, how will that then play out, sir? That would be a very problematic situation. How can they expect Iran to hold on to its end of the deal if the rest of the uh, participants are not doing their share? How does that make sense? Is there justice, sir? Well, if you've uh, seen the joint statement issued by uh, the, uh, um, uh, the other uh, signatories of the agreement, uh, they have said they will try and um, uh, maintain the economic uh, benefit that the uh, deal has given, provided Iran also um, honors its commitment on that part. So they will look into ways and means, and it is, I think, too early to be able to, uh, to see how they can go about. And earlier, as I said, the, um, the um, Beijing had made it clear that uh, they will try and safeguard uh, the, uh, the Iranian interest as well. Uh, the, it will have some effect, for example, the, the uh, Shah Bahar project, uh, 500 uh, uh, million. Uh, uh, there was a hundred uh, million pledged by the uh, European Union towards the completion of the project and so on. I don't know how this will play out, but then they are beneficiaries of the, um, uh, the Airbus deal uh, from there. So I think they will look into various uh, ways 
And I, uh, as I think President Rouhani himself said, we will wait for a few weeks to see uh, how best they are able to continue uh, to benefit um, uh, from uh, the agreement. I won't use the word benefit, but to, uh, to balance the agreement with what they had to surrender. And uh, thereafter decide whether they will uh, like to uh, abide by the existing deal uh, or they would like to you know, go on to re uh, uh, rethink uh, the, the situation. You uh, can see that uh, you know, there were um, an extreme end, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, was the possibility that, you know, of the enrichment going to industrial level and uh, so on, uh, or to even walk out from the NPT. Uh, we saw this happen in uh, North Korea. Uh, you know, after the, uh, the agreement. So these are the extreme steps. And I fully endorse my colleague's uh, point of view here about uh, the, and the fact about a, a military action on Iran. And uh, Iran, um, you know, one of the uh, charges against uh, Iran uh, is that of its ballistic missiles. Iran has a, a excellent ballistic missile capabilities. And this is something that uh, uh, the uh, Iranians are well aware, and they are within the range uh, from there. So are the uh, American uh, bases uh, within the region and around the region. So uh, the chances of uh, direct attack on Iran uh, may not be uh, likely. However, I think where the, tr uh, the problem arises, then uh, likely thing would be the stepping up of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the anti-Syrian uh, um, support, the uh, uh, rebel support in, uh, in Syria by America and also from the Gulf countries. And this is where we have to be very careful. We've had, uh, of course, a parliamentary decision as far as Yemen was concerned. We have exclusively uh, 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 kept away uh, from the, uh, um, the Arab dip uh, dispute. But we must make sure that in no way is Pakistan gets involved in the Syrian conflict. Um, you know, we are um, uh, we have a former, AG, uh, uh, former army chief who is heading this uh, coalition that has been formed there, but it is important that we should try and not get involved. Well, that's, a, that's good at sound advice, sir, but it'll be, it remains to be seen whether Pakistan can even exercise that option. Uh, before we move on, sir, uh, I want to ask, uh, just uh, mention a comment by the ex-president uh, of the United States, Mr. Barack Obama. He says that the, uh, it's a misguided uh, decision. The reality is clear that JCPOA is working. That is why today's announcement is so misguided. I believe that the decision to put the JCPOA at risk without any Iranian violation of the deal is a serious mistake. And uh, he also categorized, I mean, he had a very long uh, uh, statement that he made on this issue, and he pointed out that all the uh, 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 objections that Mr. Trump had made were really uh, not valid because those were all covered in the JCPOA. Now, having that sort of a situation uh, existing within uh, U.S. domestic politics, sir, uh, do you think a lot of uh, this uh, uh, posturing has to do with the Mr. Trump's domestic troubles? And we have the same domestic troubles for Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel as well. So do you think it's, it's a way for which to, uh, to uh, change the attention on, on their domestic troubles to these international issues so that they're safer at home? Let me try and assess it this way. If they could get away with an attack on Iran without the cost being prohibitive, they would probably want to do it. But otherwise, I agree with you that the moral high ground lies with Iran. And therefore, as my colleague uh, quite rightly suggested, Pakistan must also assume the moral high ground and not become involved in a partisan, uh, let's say, a, a cross Persian Gulf uh, conflict. We've been uh, very sensible in keeping out of Yemen. And uh, also, uh, people do note that uh, so many Muslim countries are together, but Iran was not invited to be part of this. So I agree that, uh, and I, I, I really don't apprehend Pakistan will be uh, will lack the wisdom and get involved. So Pakistan usually gets coerced or bullied into a position because we didn't want to be part of any of the after the post 9/11 scenario, but we were given a, an ultimatum by the U.S. Either you're with us or against us. In that sort of a situation, 
What can Pakistan do, sir? Well, I don't think um, the present uh, um, uh, state of affairs uh, in the world uh, situation is that Pakistan can be bullied anymore. Uh, well, that's you know, good to know, sir. Uh, yes. And what about morality in international affairs? Oh, so you course. mentioned that Iran would have the moral high ground, but does it matter? Uh, it does matter, I think. Um, uh, you have uh, principles and moral high grounds are, are things. And, you know, I thought look, that national self-interest was uh, the overall overarching governing principle and therefore morality has no, no standing in, in international affairs. That's what we've been talking about for many uh, years now, sir. Uh, well, that is true. You know, the, uh, um, there are countries who are, uh, Israel is a, is a, a country, uh, you know, is a typical example of uh, this. Next door, uh, India is another one. Uh, but the world sees it. I mean, it's might. They have the might right now. But ultimately, uh, you have to um, the on the uh, UN Charter of Principles and uh, on morality. That is an important issue. Uh, the UN has uh, proved itself to be a toothless organization on on so many occasions, sir. True. What can we expect? But let me say one thing, sir. In support of what my friend says, morality has its significance. Supposing Iran was in violation of this treaty. How would be the international reaction? It would be entirely different. It would be hostile, at least from the Europeans. Yeah. And it would certainly not bring forth any great uh, support from the Russians and the Chinese, except to counsel restraint. Right. So morality that way does weigh in into things. Yes. Because, for example, Weapons of mass de destruction yeah. in Iran are basically now known as weapons of mass deception. And the Americans have paid a certain moral price. In uh, Europe, for example, which are close allies, for having, uh, and, and uh, Tony Blair, for example, 54% of the British were opposed to the war in Iraq. And uh, Tony Blair, uh, there have been calls for him to be uh, tried as a war, war criminal. criminal. Yes, sir. So morality is operative. However, democracy is not always because 54% of the British did not want to go to war. And they had the biggest demonstration of all times in London. However, Britain did go into the war, but it was not something that has done the world much good, including Britain itself. No war ever does, sir. Well, I may add on that is the recent uh, uh, attack by the Europe, uh, America and the, and the West uh, on uh, in Syria on, on uh, alleged uh, chemical, use of chemical weapons. weapons. Sir. Yes, sir. I mean we have seen uh, what did Iraq Russian do to Iran during the eighties? Children and so on coming on the TV. And, and who was uh, who was supplying those chemical weapons to Iraq, sir? Exactly. So uh, you know, um, morality is used, uh, you know, to uh, whenever it conveniently uh, suits the West. They have always been. Uh, uh, double game, the duplicity has been a hallmark of the West when it comes to dealing with countries and so especially Muslim countries. So let's also talk about uh, the North Korean angle because uh, President Trump in his speech did mention North Korea. Uh, North Korea would be viewing uh, America's actions on the international stage, walking out of a deal that everybody else says is working uh, and uh, America unilaterally just uh, you know throwing it all to the wind and now what kind of a perception is that act going to cause in uh, Kim Jong-un's mind, for example, and the so South Koreans as well, not to mention the Chinese, and every other country that ever has to deal with the U.S.? How, what sort of a footing would they be dealing with the U.S. on? A anybody you can answer, well, sir? Uh, uh, I think, so essentially, the Koreans would be very unhappy. Look at the prospects of the Koreans suddenly since 1953. That's 65 years that they can look at the prospect of an extremist, North Korea, its leader walking into South Korea and talking about the possibility or the, the strong possibility of giving up nuclear weapons, of uh, possible reunification in the future, although it may not be talked of in such clear terms. Uh, at the moment. So therefore, uh, I think the Americans to stand to lose a lot because why should Kim Jong-un not take notice of the fact that there is the Kyoto Protocol, there is the Paris Agreement, and there is uh, the NAFTA is in trouble. And so America is becoming less and less reliable even for its own North American neighbors. 
and it is becoming less reliable and dependable on uh, taking cognizance of European interests, legitimate European interests. And since you said that in foreign policy, uh, perhaps legitimate national or all kinds of national interests probably take precedent in this world of uh, hard practical nosed, uh, you know, hard nosed practical reality. Real politic. So, real politics. So I think uh, the Americans will have quite a cost to pay. And uh, you've also correctly pointed out uh, the fact that both the US and Israel have domestic problems. And uh, diversion into war does make people suddenly patriotic for a while. But then you better have a quick, neat, clean, fast, effective, cost, uh, cost effective victory. Otherwise, the Americans have been in Afghanistan for the longest time, 16 years now. And uh, many American generals have been obliged to openly say, we have lost the war. So that doesn't do much for the image of the single superpower. Whatever its plans, whatever its uh, desire to create instability rather than outright victory, uh, apart. But it has not added to the international stature of the United States even as a power with uh, a lot of nuisance value. Right, sir. Very briefly, sir, if you would also like to comment on this. Yes, uh, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, North Koreans, much like uh, Iran, um, have been under sanctions and uh, uh, ph uh, phenomenal economic difficulties. Hardship, they feel. Yes, and I think um, the, um, the President um, uh, Kim, uh, 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 I think uh, did something uh, extraordinary by agreeing um, uh, to uh, uh, dismantle his nuclear uh, capabilities. And um, of course, Trump capitalized on that by saying that it is all because of his aggressive policies, you know, bigger uh, and uh, uh, button to press and so forth. Um, now the, the problem is that uh, whereas uh, the Koreans, uh, South Korea and North Korea are genuinely keen to put an end uh, to the, um, uh, and have a peace uh, uh, agreement uh, between them. Uh, but uh, there are uh, concerns uh, of, um, uh, in the past, of course, of China. Uh, if the American um, presence is there, it would mean the American uh, forces would be on bordering China before long. Um, Japan will also be concerned with the rise of a, a greater uh, Korea in the region. So uh, there were reservations about the deal going through, but uh, now that it was going forward, it looked very good, but it was something which was coming from top to bottom rather than the, the nitty gritties of it being resolved and then a summit taking place. So um, uh, what is the main uh, uh, issue here, the main concern here would be, how will this uh, deal play out? Um, since the Americans, cannot be relied upon uh, any commitment that they made. If they are going to, you know, uh, uh, Trump has very clearly said that he wants a quick deal, as I mentioned earlier, for them to totally dismantle uh, their nuclear uh, facilities. And uh, he said they will consider uh, in, uh, about withdrawal of the troops from there and in, uh, making a deal nuclearized. So I think it is very important that um, the um, uh, North Koreans uh, make sure that they uh, get themselves a good deal. Because if uh, they do succeed in uh, getting the Americans to commit and start withdrawing uh, first from the, their forces from there and start giving economic assistance to them, so it should be a sort of uh, gradual process whereby the whole process and agreement can come about. If they don't do that, I think the North Korean would be best uh, to uh, not touch it with that 10-foot pole. Well, thank you very much, sir, for taking out the time and sharing your views with PTV World. Well, you heard the conversation, and in conclusion, we always say that please do draw your own conclusions from what you've heard. We hope and pray that uh, the world moves towards a more peaceful state rather than the one that we are witnessing now. And on that hope, and with that, uh, on that note, it's goodbye.
25,000 in its